Audio. Test, 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 test. Testing, hello, hello. testing. Hello, hello. Thanks everyone for bearing with us. Um, yes, Turn let's on. make that happen again. There you go. See us. There you go. Um, and then make sure we want to make sure the audience can hear you. Um, I think they can now. Do you want to say hi? Oh, hello. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Great. You're on. Um, okay. And then here. Okay. Um, awesome. Hello, hello, hello. I'm going to just quickly listen to the sound. Here. Here's a test. Here's an audio test. We're doing our own levels tonight, Taylor. <laughs> mm -hmm. How's it sound? Sounds awesome. Great. Taylor, could you say a, 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 a just... Or wait, uh, you're in the past in. about to say something in the stream that I'm listening to. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going through now. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Good. Blah, Amazing. Blah, blah. Well, thank Hi, you, everyone. everyone. <laughs> thank you for waiting. We're a bit late today, um, but it's going to be extremely worth it. Um, yes. Welcome to another uh, episode of Thursday Night Live, a live streaming series from the Mackenzie Art Gallery. I'm Kat Blimke. I'm Jonathan Carroll. And we're digital coordinators at the gallery. So Thursdays at 9 p.m. Central, we partner with artists, curators, and educators to deliver workshops, panels, or screenings that reflect on how to view, how to enjoy, or how to make digital art. Uh, you, the audience watching, play a key role in this. During tonight's um, episode, you will be able to ask questions by typing in the text chat. Uh, this chat box is located on the right-hand side of the video for those of you who are watching on a desktop computer and below the video for those of you watching on a mobile or tablet. Uh, the chat is an important feature of any live stream because this is where you can join in uh, and the liveness uh, really takes hold. Uh, if Whether you are watching tonight through Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, uh, you will be able to access the chat. But if you can't access the chat, make sure you are logged into the platform through which you are viewing it. Um, we encourage you to ask questions at any time, uh, and we will try our best to answer them, for sure. Uh, and you can always use the chat to talk with other audience members as well. Just remember that there's always another person at the end of that username, so please be respectful. So tonight uh, we continue looking at the recent digital exhibition Insight, which you can see on your screen in front of you, um, which was presented by the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba. Um, we will be talking with uh, Taylor MacArthur uh, about her half of the show and learning more about her practice that uses environment design and 360 videos to explore Indigenous futurism. Um, our conversation and speculations about possible futures, of course, happens through digital technology that depends on infrastructure like servers and towers that sit on real land, not just in digital space. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land we are gathered on for this live stream, where uh, Kat and I are, is uh, Treaty 4 territory, the homeland of the Cree, the Soto, the Lakota, the Nakota, the Dakota, and the Métis people. You are gathered wherever you might be out there. And so I'd like to introduce our guest for this evening, uh, Taylor MacArthur. Thank you so much for joining us, Taylor. Um, yes. Could we ask you to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Taylor MacArthur. I'm Nakota Inu, and I'm part of uh, the Pheasant Rump Nakota First Nation, which is actually located in Saskatchewan. It's about two hours from where I am here, and I'm located in Brandon, Manitoba, which is actually on Treaty 2 territory. And I'm a digital artist working within like the intersection of like, 3D animation, video game design, which is mainly environment and video. And so like a lot of the work I do involves like 3D software. Um, I use Blender a lot to create my work, and I'm just learning how to apply those 3D skills now within Unity, so I'm hoping to develop more work this year. Um, that we're going to see the, um, the um, awesome series of pieces that you made for the Insight exhibit. Last week, uh, we talked to Dallas Flett-Wapash um, about 
the uh, the eight bit video games that he made as part of uh, his uh, work at the Insight Show. And so uh, tonight we're going to explore some of the some of the worlds that you made for this. Um, so uh, the the Insight Show uh, it's a digital exhibition now, but it was originally. Um, going to uh, be a, a physical installation at the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba. And yeah. that's sort of we're seeing. And then so we're, we're seeing a virtual version of what that physical installation would have looked like in front of our screens now. Um, that, of course, all, all changed because of the uh, pandemic. Um, could you tell us a bit about um, the uh, process of uh having to move a show that you planned out to be physical into the digital space and um maybe what what your reaction to that that change was yeah um yeah so dallas and i first decided to visit the physical space early on in order to get like a sense of like what it was that we were trying to achieve and we had to keep in mind that it was like a joint show and then how we wanted our works to be shown in like a certain order when you come into the gallery space there. So like for my half, I had imagined um, like colored lighting to complement like the aesthetic that I was trying to achieve. Um, so I wanted like a mix of colors to like wash over the physical space. Um, yeah, so when we were in there, we were like trying to keep in mind everything. We both realized we had like a lot of sound in our pieces and like a couple of mine were gonna have like ambient sound and then Dallas has all had like the um, the sounds from like his arcade kind of games that he was going to make there. Um, and we were a little bit like worried and over thinking things and thinking that people might be overwhelmed with like all these different sounds coming into that space there. So like a piece of mine that I had wanted to do was like a 360 um, video experience with like the VR headset and like just sitting down in the seat and you're supposed to be able to like look around in one of the environments that I created. And it's actually the first one in this exhibition. And um, also like a few other my, of my other pieces were supposed to be um, like videos with like headsets. And then so we kind of realized um, like a lot of our works that we're gonna have was going to be like for the public to interact with. And then we realized like when COVID came there in March, like that might be a big problem. And then all of a sudden everything just came to a halt. Like even the city was so quiet. There was like no one heading out anywhere. And there was all these rules put in place. And then we had a, like had to have a meeting to we, um, strategize, strategize our plan. And um, yeah, we realized it wouldn't be safe for the public to like gather in small groups um, in a closed area and like let alone interact with like the high touch surfaces of the exhibition. So we like, yeah, we really had no idea like how long this was going to last for or like how long the rules were going to be in place for. So like that's when we decided to go into this online exhibition. And then we were both like a little worried and unsure because it seems totally new to us. Like this was Dallas and I's first exhibition too. We've never done anything like this. So we kind of tried our best to uh, like research and see what other outcomes um, galleries were doing online and how it was structured you we know, are trying to keep in mind um yeah how to how to plan that out now in a digital space so dallas was the one that kind of came up with the idea of like hosting our work within um unity and like creating these rooms where like the users could like go through and interact with the individual individual pieces like online then so I had barely touched Unity before this, so it was kind of my first time that I really had to work with the software. And I was a little worried that I wasn't going to be able to learn it quick enough to bring all my pieces in, but whenever I had questions about it, I always, I'd ask Dallas and he'd um, tell me and like reply right away. And there's also good old Google and YouTube, which helped out a lot. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I feel like that, I don't know, rushing or not really rushing, but just having the work in it like made me learn the software a lot quicker than I actually expected to. Thrown into the deep end. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> yeah, I pretty much only just worked with 3D, so a uh, 3D and video. So this was like a whole new area for me. And all the and different. Then... Oh, sorry. The, or, oh, sorry. You can just <laughs> the works that you had uh, uh, were were also they were there was a 
they require you had also been working in a ar right augmented reality and some of those works yeah. could then uh you know you need that physical space um so i'm, I'm very uh look maybe we'll come across this after you finish but i'm yeah, <laughs> interested in, in um, the processes that you did to sort of uh be able to present those in a new context that was entirely screen based but sorry yeah. you were you were saying yeah. something <laughs> i'm gonna say like i'll kind of start by going off like how I um, changed like the pieces then for this format here. So like I, originally the first piece, like I had said, I wanted it like a chair, VR headset sitting down. And then that's when I had to implement that into Unity. And when I, um, yeah, I had to figure out how to work the camera to make it um, be able to like pan around within the space there. Can, is our, can we jump right into the, the piece? Yeah. Cool. Thank you for doing such a good uh, segue transition for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how's, well, just this work has audio, right? Oh, yeah. So um, we just want to make sure that. that's coming through for the audience, for everyone at home watching. Um, sorry, I will just... We have a Br Bruce Young in the chat watching. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, uh, Bruce. Yeah, so for... Um, yeah, for this piece, I kind of wanted to have it as, I guess, like all of my pieces, it's kind of like a storyline from like the first to the fifth one. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of talking about like a journey and like this piece, I wanted it to have like, um, like a portal kind of mysteriously appearing and like disappearing and you're kind of looking around the environment and it's supposed to kind of give like a glimpse of the future, or, like kind of to draw you in, into that circle there. So I, um actually had created this whole environment in Blender and I actually wanted to um, export it out in Blender and uh, but it, I was just having some trouble there with my computer so I actually just brought this into um, Unity as like a sky material for the background. Very so the the uh, the the grass and the sky that we're seeing is like a yeah. uh, the that's the horizon in unity or the skybox in unity that we're looking at yeah yeah i, I just really... rendered out like a 360 image from blender and then like pasted up the material in unity that was my workaround nice <laughs> I, that. I think that's a great example of how when you're in these uh tight situations where you have to figure out how to make things work quickly you you figure out the the smart work the sort of problem solving you have to do to figure out the workarounds. Oh my gosh, yeah, there's so much problem solving in this. Like <laughs> the portal that I had wanted to, it looked totally different in Blender, but I couldn't export that. I was just having some problems because like I just am self-taught in Blender here. So mm. I actually just made this portal here in Unity. I figured out a way to um, type the script up, I don't know, uh, the particle system, there we go. <laughs> yeah um so the the particle system the the portal is this sort of swirling uh, particle system and the yeah. is it is the setting of this uh, environment that you designed um whereas your other your other settings in your pieces have this sort of like definite like uh futuristic look to it or mm -hmm. um uh maybe a, like this a neon soaked cyberpunk look um, is, yeah. but this, this scene is different from those. Is it, this scene yeah. is set in the present or is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was trying to go for. I set it in the present and I kind of like, um, took it from a memory of like my childhood and tried to recreate it within here. So I kind of put some like particles to act as like little fireflies going around. Cause that's like one thing that I can remember from my childhood then. Um, the, yeah, I think the, the fireflies at dusk is, uh, it sets the, t the tone for this sort of like nostalgic feeling very well. Um, yeah. the, so the, the particles that we're seeing, um, though, though I think in just, uh, listening to you talk about it in the talk that you gave for the, for the opening of Insight, I think mm -hmm. did, is this is supposed to act as a portal to the next scene is how the transition fits together. Yeah, that's how I was trying to make it. Cool. 
Um, I, yeah, I like learning about the little technical tricks that uh, go into this. I think uh, it's important that, uh, or it's, it's important that people learn about all the sort of problem solving, like you said, that, that artists yeah. who are working with digital media have to do because I think all artists are pretty good uh, problem solvers, but you really, especially when you're working on the timeline that, that you folks were working on, um, I guess yeah. you had about three or four months to figure out how to transition all of this to digital. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, tough, but yeah, I, I somehow powered through it and got it in there. <laughs> so thankfully it was almost right before the show had started too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, very impressive. And yeah. it's, it's cool that you were able to add this whole other, uh, dimension to your, um, practice now of like knowing how to work with unity and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it was very exciting for us. It was very exciting for us to see this exhibit as well. Just, I, I mean, I mentioned this, uh, I've mentioned this before, just being, uh, so excited about seeing, you know, digital art on digital platforms, digital galleries, making it look, uh, so even though, although a lot of these works were intended to be digital works shown inside of the uh, a, a gallery, it, it really, it, it's exciting to also see them delivered to audiences through uh, when you can't get to the gallery or put on a VR headset safe, safely in theory, uh, th that these, these still look great and they still are uh, really taking advantage of what we can uh, like us as audience members have in front of us, which for me, of course, is just my laptop all the time, but, <laughs> and then, yeah, to transform it into a, a, a viewing experience. So yeah. great. And another, th I also like this uh, whole exhibition a lot in the context of uh, looking at other, um, I don't know if you want to call them digital galleries or, or virtual art galleries. Um, you mentioned that you and Dallas uh, um, did a bit of uh, research or looking around at what other sorts of like online art galleries mm -hmm. or other ways that online uh, art was being presented. Can you talk a bit more about yeah. that? Like what you liked or what you didn't like and what other people were, were doing? Well, it was, um, it was really hard to come across stuff for us. <laughs> We didn't really like know what we were looking for at first mm -hmm. or like um how to set up our pieces and i it's almost hard for me to remember now how we got to that process um because like at first when dallas um kind of explained like this whole unity um exhibition like because i had never worked in it before i couldn't really like contextualize it and like see it in my head like how it was gonna work out um but then yeah, I don't know. We just somehow made all these rooms and then it just like all came together for us. So. Uh, one thing that I think works really well about it is uh, it's very user friendly. Um, like it's very obvious what you're supposed to do to see all the different pieces. Um, yeah, I, we're blocking it right now with our heads, but there's a move <laughs> between the exhibition. But wait this way. Yeah. <laughs> So we're using, uh, if we scroll down here, there's toggles over here. And unfortunately as well, or unfortunately, fortunately, but unfortunately, uh, there's an information button that we are also hiding accidentally. Let's, uh, let's change that. So that just so the, the people watching can get the full yeah. experience. Full experience. So we're just live. It's live, folks. We're just <laughs> changing the thing, this aspect ratio. How does around. that look? That looks good, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then it gives you details about the work. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You so click up on the information button. Uh, oops. Sorry. <laughs> Centering the, the uh, portal again. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I was wondering, I just, uh, another general question I had is just um, how you titled your work or, and then, like, if... Uh, uh, you had any comments about the role that uh, language plays uh, in the pieces that you're presenting here? Yeah. Um, so for me, I guess, like, I kind of tried to base it off of, like, tribal identity and family, va family values. So, like, um, historically dresses um, that the plains women wore um, express, like, their creativity, marks significant events, such as, like, marriage, family members, um, and family pride. 
And so I wanted this to be like an outward expression of my tribal identity, family values. Um, I tried to like influence or bring in pieces of like Dakota or like a Cinnaboyan geometric shapes. And I like that my family had always like encouraged me to express my creativity and they like never um, were against it at all. So I guess um, using this art was a way of me preserving my cultural and traditions and values and, and using this new form of media. So I found like to like Saskatchewan is a primary location for most like a Cinnabon reserve. Like there's none here in Manitoba and I actually wasn't aware of that until a few years ago. And um, I just noticed too, like a lot of the times when I would say that I was in Dakota, a lot of people would try to correct me and be like, oh, like you mean Dakota or Lakota? Cause it's something that they often like mistake those three for which they're all like, they're all part of like the same group, but like the Dakota just branched off mm -hmm. oh, years ago. And then so like because of COVID this year, I wasn't actually able to head off into Saskatchewan to visit with like family and elders like I had originally planned, but I had um, like, books, um, family and like resources here that I could like find information about language. And then I actually had a family member from um, Saskatchewan direct me to like an app that was developed to use along with um, there's like an online dictionary where um, I like I used a lot too. So I kind of used like the resources that I had available to me. And then like for like the title pieces, I pretty much just chose like one one word, one word titles because like I'm just starting out with the language and like sometimes the word um, changes based on the context of the sentence. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want to make it all like too complicated since I couldn't actually sit there and like um, communicate with somebody and ask like is Sorry, folks, just a second. It's very ironic. It's at the moment we're discussing the inability Sorry, to communicate. Yeah, we lost you for a <laughs> just as you were saying, it's challenging to communicate just... at this moment. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, just... we are Sorry, just... I, can't, I can't see your guys' screen now. Yeah, we'll just... get it all fixed up. No worries. <laughs> yeah. uh, ba -ba -ba. Okay. There's us, and now just getting you back in the same screen that we are. Yes, it's always so okay. funny. Yeah. <laughs> Online stuff, yep. Online, yeah, yeah. indeed. Um, yeah, because we have, um, there is so much that digital technology can give us, but then so many headaches that it causes at the yeah. same I wish time. it could take away too. <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, yeah. The, the, sorry, the stream isn't seeing you. I just have to change Make sure mm -hmm. that's pointed at the right window. Um, there, there we go. We. You're back. <laughs> back in action. Thank okay, you. I'm yeah. sorry, everybody, uh, but we are at the whim of our. The, it's uh, what makes it live and exciting. Yes, yeah. The <laughs> constant fear of failure is where the excitement comes from. Yeah. Um, so I guess we kind of just kind of pick up where I left please, off. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Taylor. Okay. Yeah, so I was just saying that I'm, I was hoping to spend more time this year um, with like members of my community and like family there. And like, I feel like once you start like immersing yourself in the culture, like the language kind of comes hand in hand. So like, I feel like a lot of the words in the language are tied to the community and the land that it's part of. And then it pretty much cut me off right at the end of what I was trying to say. Um, the, yes, it's, well, uh, it's a super interesting, this uh, thing that you're talking about of like incorporating uh, uh, the words and language as well as like the, um, uh, the visual uh, culture. Um, it, mm -hmm. it really does this thing of like what, what this scene is doing of tying together the present with the future that we are, are about to be uh, immersed in in the next scene. Yeah. Um, so maybe we should move to that now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, <laughs> this one was uh, a lot of work to do too. It took forever to render out in Blender where I made these. Yeah. So, so sorry, sorry. Please continue. 
<laughs> no, sorry, what were you going to say? I'm just, ex I'm just overly excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so I guess for like this piece, I just tried to um, like imagine like um, the interior of like a spacecraft influenced by like indigenous people, say like engineers, architects, designers, I just kind of pick up like how I would imagine something might look like. And this is just kind of like a camera. So you're just looking around the room, kind of looking everywhere. And then like, I tried to pick patterns that the Nakoda people traditionally favor. So that's why you're going to kind of see like reds, um, blues and yellows. And then for like that piece in the center there, um, we kind of wanted to create this like glowing orb, almost acting as like fire that like kind of never dies, but it's like, um, I don't know, like a light that's flashing. And then I wanted to bring in colors too of like the medicine wheel to serve as like a you know, historical context for this journey that we're kind of on. Um, the process of uh, rendering things um, is indeed very time consuming. And I think it's uh, something that as, as artists who are working, you know, independently or not, we're, we're not big uh, studios that have a whole bunch of computers to do the rendering yeah. for us. And uh, can you it, just it, talk about that process a bit more? Uh, yeah. Be, uh, because I'm sure there's, uh, I'm sure people watching aren't familiar with um, how you actually go about uh, producing a video like this. Yeah. So for like rendering in Blender, there's two different options. Like you can render out, um, like an mp4 so it's just like a straight video or um you can do like an image sequence and then i found like for some reason every time i tried to do like an mp4 it would crash like for pretty much most of my pieces i would get like almost there especially for that first piece we just looked at i had like i don't even know 10 tries of me trying to render that out in cycles in blender and it just kept crashing it was so frustrating yeah so wow. then i figured out that just rendering out the images was a lot easier so then it's not that hard to because i'd have to bring them into like another software and then just create like um uh video sequence then from those images and then they were out as an mp4 so thankfully like there's like so there's all these different little workarounds that you can do in these softwares yeah it would uh, if only it could just produce easily produce the MP4 file right out of Blender, <laughs> but yeah. not one added this. step, yeah, or multiple added steps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like there's two different like render engines in um, Blender, so like a lot of the work in here is in EV, which like creates that nice like bloom glowing effect that you see in most of my work there, and then if you use Cycles, it's like. Um, it just looks like more realistic and like everything looks sharper and cleaner. So like some of my pieces, I kind of like experimented and like rendered them out in cycles, which just took so a lot longer or just still images. Cause that's how like it, it wouldn't render them out. It would just take that long. <laughs> so I actually have like a still image of this scene here, like right when the camera's panned at the center and it looks so nice in cycles. So. I just need to get myself a really nice computer that can actually <laughs> graphics card that can actually render that out. <laughs> and and for our audience at home, um, the different types of so of programs like three D modeling programs have different um, sort of defaults that uh, when they're when they're make when they're rendering something out that to to an image like what what we're seeing here, uh, they can look different between platforms. So um, maybe. Uh, you were mentioning before, like with, uh, you know, being introduced with Unity, kind of it having a different look and different, uh, like visual look. Um, that's mm -hmm. something that like artists, just for the context of the audience who might not be as versed, uh, art mm -hmm. artists moving from one program to another won't necessarily be able to recreate things that they are, or it won't look the same. There's there's all these yeah. steps <laughs> that, yeah. that come into yeah, it play. Yeah, changes so much. You, yeah, your whole aesthetic can be based or just like so heavily influenced by these, uh, the software, or even in the case of within Blender, the different render engines that you choose can yeah. determine a lot of what your aesthetic looks like. Yeah. Yeah, this one took a little bit because I had actually animated all like those um, 
um, like arrows that you see, like they're all kind of like supposed to like be flickering like a neon light. And like each one of those animations had to go out to which took quite a long time to go. Right. Um, and you would want, you would have to, I, I just imagine you would have to do each of them sort of individually. So they're not all just doing the exact same. There must be some bit of like customization on each different animation. Yeah. Um, I can't, oh my gosh, yeah, it's been a while since I remember how I did that now. <laughs> it looks really good. It, look, it looks very neon. Yeah, that's what I was trying to go for. But yeah, I'm trying to remember how I got about um, animating those. I think, yeah, I somehow clicked, uh, selected all of them and then just applied one animation to them all. So it's all, like, they're all blinking in uniform. <laughs> There's some... So, like, that's why... Sorry. Oh, I, I just, I love uh, the effect of the light or the, the texture that you sort of see on, of the reflection of the light on the, um, on the surfaces uh, is especially mm -hmm. sort of, I don't know, mesmerizing, or it has a very, it really makes you feel like they are real uh, surfaces. Like there's a, there's a real texture to yeah. them. Yeah, that's what I like to, I can spend like so much time like tweaking and playing around with um, like these environments that I make because like I could sit here for hours and like oh no this doesn't look right and I'm like changing this modifying that and yeah so I tried to yeah get a lot of like metallic in this scene here because I wanted it to look like metal kind of like a spaceship um well yeah I was sort of wondering um what other uh what other things do, i guess we are we are talking about the sort of uh influences uh from uh culture and language that go into um creating these spaces but i was wondering just uh more uh uh in other what other ways or sorry i'm not phrasing this very well uh how else do you um decide the way that things will look in the future that you've designed here, like the design of the rooms that we're in and that tunnel that we just emerged from? That's a really good question. I'm trying to think of like how my process is for that. Um, hold on. I think for me, I often, I don't know, I try to just imagine like how I picture um a future like i've always really liked sci-fi movies um certain tv shows and i feel like they've just kind of been there my whole life and i've always been like super um interested in that so i try to um sorry i'm not even wording this right either now <laughs> no i think i think that makes sure. sense maybe more specifically yeah. do you have um uh do, do you have a um a process for designing these that starts uh before you get into the 3d engine like do yeah. you use pen I, and paper or yep. yeah i definitely use um pen and paper i actually will usually start out with like just um like jotting words down like on a piece of paper in my notebook and um yeah, kind of like feelings associated with it. And then like, I try to just like picture that in my mind. So I'm just gonna say I'm picturing a scene that I wanna create right now. Um, it's like a creek that I like to go sit by. And so I try to picture like the color. So I'm imagining it at like golden hour. So like it's kind of yellow washing over everything. Like I picture um, warmth and then like tiny, like kind of bugs flying around that you can see in the light. Um, like the water underneath, the feeling I get in there, like feeling like calm and at peace. And then I try to piece all of these together and like connect them and almost like I'm placing them inside this like little box. And that like, if I close my eyes and like picture that and then open them up, it's like I'm in that scene there. So that's how I go about creating these here. Um, that's really, I, I, that's really nice. And what I like about it is, um, uh, this idea of uh, 
environmental design or environmental storytelling is something mm -hmm. that uh, people talk a lot about in video games as well as just in like uh, 3D uh, 3D modeling and uh, like sort of this process of world building that's involved in all these cases. And yeah. um, what I like from what you were talking about is it's not just the, I don't know, the structure that you're in or the the uh, the building that you're in, but um, this sort of like total totality of all the different things that make up the experience of being in a place. Um, yeah. Like you just now are, were mentioning the, the way something feels and uh, which all of that is very important, I think, to... Uh, building a world that you can get immersed in and, and feels like a real place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's all right. Um, I, well, yeah, more, I was wondering if you had, um, uh, like, specifically in building doing what I guess I would call like uh, in environmental storytelling or environment design. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think that uh, sort of gives you as a way of telling stories that other ways of telling stories or, or other ways of art making uh, doesn't necessarily give you? Mm, yeah, like I'm just going to say like when I first started college, like I was just pretty much doing 2D work. Like 3D, I didn't really step into until like um, my second year and then I, I for creating this work like I based it off of like the environments that I'm around and like I find too like um, so say for like that first piece um, that I made there like I I realized traveling anywhere like I in some places in Europe here and like in the Rockies um, like the prairies have like an amazing sunset and sky and I never realized like how much I actually took that for granted and then so I just um I try to keep that in mind and then I try to like translate that into this medium I guess of like digital medium um yeah I don't know how to explain that it's just kind of inherently always been there wanting to share what I see with people and um, the world around me I guess yeah, it's interesting that you just because the through uh, 3D modeling uh, in in this case using Blender, because you can create these sort of worlds that surround us, at least in a, on a screen, this sort of like simulation of a world that surrounds us. It yeah. really it really lets us uh, express some of that uh, feeling of of being in a space. And then there's so much so much sort of like storytelling or, or so much communication that can happen by uh, sort of letting someone feel what it feels like to be in a space that is coming either from your head or from your memories. Yeah. yeah I try to like even think about sound. Like I know in some of the pieces like you can't actually hear, but there's like a little, there's always a little bit of like ambient noise in like each of the pieces. So I tried to make this one kind of sound like kind of empty and like eerie because like there's no one in here right now you, can, you don't see anyone in there and you don't know where we're traveling to so um the yeah there's every good sci-fi scene needs a good <laughs> like sci-fi ambient uh background noise <laughs> yeah. uh, uh it's kind of it thinking about uh uh I mean, I think of ambient noise as relaxing. And uh, Dallas uh, has thrown a question into the chat um, about this, <laughs> about the, on this subject. Um, he yeah. he says the movement of the tunnel is almost hypnotic. I'm sure there's a more accurate word for that. LOL. No, I think that's <laughs> accurate. <laughs> but is this that? But is this that feeling something you'd like to pursue? The hypnosis, that sort of calming rhythmic motion. Oh, wow. Yeah, good question, Dallas. Just always tough throwing out the tough ones. But <laughs> I didn't even realize that that's um, what it is that I'm doing. Like, now that he points that out, I realize when I'm kind of thinking back on, like, some of the other pieces I made, it's always soft, um, easy movements. So, huh. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> I think there's something about um, a lot of 3D animation lends itself to that sort of um, hypnotic, uh, uh, I don't know, rhythmic movement, like 
um, because a lot of three a lot of three D animation, especially when you're moving the camera around, it's very smooth. It's sort of moving mm -hmm. through a space. Um, uh, it, you, it, it's also in when you're doing three D modeling, like in this hallway. It's often mm -hmm. uh, if you're creating a large space, you want to be sort of duplicate replicating um, parts of the space over and over again, which is why hallways work so well in three D <laughs> models. Uh, yeah. So I feel like that out of those like sort of characteristics of the medium, as well as the pulsing light here coming from the way that animation is happening, um, it yeah. sort of lends itself to this like, I don't know, hypnotic feeling of immersion, really. Like it's sort of it's sort of like drawing you into the world through its yeah. uh, through the rhythm of it. Yeah, that's great. Like I, I didn't even think of it that way. So it's funny that he pointed it out now, so I can see it now. <laughs> Let's yeah. take a look at it. Um, uh, there's still more. There's several pieces in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this. This is what I was uh, uh, interested in in hearing you speak about earlier because uh, these were augmented reality uh, works. Initially. Yeah, they were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, could yeah, you tell? Um, yeah, that's a little more about like. Uh, well, the works themselves, and then maybe the their initial uh, what they look were intended to look like in the gallery, and then how they came to be yeah. as they are here. Yeah, so um, I guess like in the gallery, um, we had planned it to be like hanging on like this uh, or a piece of like acrylic um, sheeting that was like clear hanging in one point in the gallery. Um, this would be like I can't remember. How many feet wide but it was supposed to be enough to have i think 12 yeah 12 on each side so um i guess so that like the people could come around and like hold their phones up and look at the pieces individually with like this ar platform that i was going to use originally but then obviously with, with um covid we had to like put it online here and then i don't know if like for me um i kind of found it hard to like bring in AR in this space like that you could really interact with like I know in one of Dallas's pieces like he's got um that like three posters that are kind of like staggered and like that's what I um was gonna do with these pieces here but then actually um after talking with like my mentor um we kind of came across this idea of making them as animated gifts which is like something that I also didn't even think of and so I just um same thing, render these out like little layers and then in animations and then brought them into this space here. So it it totally changed the, this piece here. And then, um, yeah, so this is supposed to be like the the 12 moons of the Assiniboine calendar and the Kota calendar. And uh, so um, when I was like reading over or looking over this stuff here, <laughs> I can't like pronounce them properly because like I'm still learning. So this one's supposed to be We Chu Gondu Sandugu, which is supposed to be Center Moon's younger brother. So I took um like those translations and tried to like picture like how I would illustrate or like animate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in this piece I have, yeah, like two two moons. It's supposed to be like in the winter time, so like that's why I have the blues on there. We can. I don't mind going through all of them if you don't mind going. I, I would love to. I would love yes. to. Uh, yeah. Hear what the thought oh. or what what the background of each one is. Yeah, this one. I hope I'm just not butchering these so bad because like I'm still I'm still learning, so it's like the whole process here trying to learn like another um, language that you're not fully versed in. So this one is supposed to be January, which is we Chugandu, which is just center moon so i just tried to picture um i guess like a moon in the winter time and how sometimes you see like those like the ice crystals and it almost makes like a like a glow around the moon so that's what i was trying to interpret with this piece here awesome and are these um you mentioned uh in uh, a, a previous talk that you did that uh you like uh vector animation or vector graphics and, and 2d illustration digital 2d illustration yeah. are these all yeah. digital 2d illustrations yeah, yeah, I made them all in Adobe Illustrator. So. Oh, I, <laughs> that's I where love I love it. Yeah, I, that's what I had started out with in college, and I love making um, 
with illustrations all the time, like little posters, or I'd make really cool um, artworks. So yeah, that's. I hadn't touched it in a while, so this was my first time going back in almost like a year. So, and uh, some of the iconography you were kind of mentioning earlier about your desire to kind of uh, integrate some more traditional, uh, like cultural imagery, some geometric forms. Um, mm -hmm. That at, and do you find then uh, that this software is like particularly that you're able to express that particularly well through Illustrator? Oh yeah. Yeah, because the shapes, like, it's just um, such, like, clean lines, and you can make, like, the colors super vibrant, but, like, I guess for, like, my pieces, I didn't make them. Like, the colors stand out a lot, but, yeah, I, I found that it helped. And so this one is supposed to be um, February, which is Am Amhanska, which is supposed to be the long dry moon. Mm -hmm. They're so nice to look yeah, at. Yeah, they're so beautiful. I'd love to see this as a yeah. calendar on the wall. Wow. That's really yeah. If it was an I mean, augmented reality calendar, that would be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. I don't know why. I really liked this one. This one's March, and it's supposed to be Cha Oh, Sha Dizen, which is like Sore Eye Moon. So that's why I try to create like the... Um, the sun rays coming out and like reflecting off of the snow there oh awesome yeah, it's beautiful that reflection it uh and then the hills it's just very very yeah. evocative while at the same time being like uh, i don't know looking like a cool graphic but also <laughs> looking like a landscape yeah um, yeah this one is april which is frog moon so it's Taba Hawaii. <laughs> oh, I love it. This, the little frog. Oh, it's so nice. Yeah. And this one, that, that one, it's quite like you changed the, um, the, like the, the, the animation slightly faster in that one. So you get a yeah. feeling of, of more, of more motion, of more energy with the frog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one was supposed to be kind of like the Milky Way kind of like appearing oh, fast cool. like in the background there. Cool. Um, yeah, this one is supposed to be May, so um, Idle Moon, which is Induiga, which I just tried to picture like how I see May. It's mm -hmm. like green, everything's coming to life then. So weather's finally getting nice. <laughs> And this one is June, which is Wanba Woshmoe. Just supposed to be uh, the full leaf moon. So oh, this one had a few different iterations, but I I settled with um, the pine trees because I liked like you know the geometric shapes and the artwork here. So yeah. I tried to keep it in most of my pieces. So. Um, it's really, yeah, the, and the, the, uh, patterns uh, on the trees evokes leaves quite well too, while also still being like super abstract and representational. Oh no. Oh, oh, we oh, keep no. losing discord. Dear, dear discord. We'll get, we'll get her Taylor. back. It's dropped. Oh. Hello. 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 Sorry. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> this is just the internet. The or internet. just Discord. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, because we're still streaming. Yeah, mm -hmm. the stream is still this... going, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. We do have um, from uh, Matthias Graham on uh, YouTube um, responding to the gifts, uh, the gift work saying that uh, these are so awesome. The gifts looping. Uh, with the layers makes it feel like they're constantly being rendered, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I'd like to see it one day in augmented reality. <laughs> can, yeah. can you just make sure your camera is on there, Taylor? Oh, my God. There we go. Sorry about that. No, 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 <laughs> no. that's okay. It's our silly didn't even realize that it wasn't on. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, I'd really like to see these pieces in VR too. That's a whole nother, another little project I have to work on. 
Bye. Oh, interesting. Very yeah. cool to, um, here, let me make sure the audience can see you. Uh, it's it, uh, a cool sort of um, uh, cross uh, media thing to take a, a 2D work and, and bring it into a 3D environment. Um, but I think there's a lot of cool potential to that. Um, I I do want to look at the other ones <laughs> closely because they're just so enjoyable. Yeah. Um, okay, this one is supposed to be July, which is like the red berry moon. So it's just hua sha sha. And uh, yeah, I just tried to picture this one too because I used to go, um, I guess, picking berries a lot mm -hmm. in the summertime when I was down there in Saskatchewan. Um, uh, Dallas had another interesting comment uh, that the, the looping nature of the gifts uh, conveys the idea of time or the progression of a day which is which is really true yeah also the sort of way that a calendar is a bit of a loop uh even though mm -hmm. we're moving forward in time we are also spiraling through the same loop over and over again yeah yeah i tried to keep them all circular too mm -hmm. um like all of these pieces within that circle there because i found like um when i talk with family a lot too they'd also bring like that the circle is like the way of life everything comes in like um different stages but it's always like looping back around so that's why yeah this animation has it just reminded me of that looking at this now um yeah so this one is august which is chanta sapsaba which is the black cherry moon hi and the this this sort of geometric uh pointed form in the center is that Oh, sorry, let me I tried, to, tried to make that one like reference like a star. Cool. Yeah. And this one is supposed to be September. Um, so Waba Giwi, which is the yellow leaf moon. Mm. Oh, lovely. <laughs> uh, very nice gradient in the background. <laughs> I Thank used you. to love working with gradients. Like that was my made so much stuff with different gradients all the time. <laughs> and then sort of this background of the galaxy is nice too. Yeah. Like yeah. To have the context of all these works being yeah, yeah. within the stars. Uh, yeah, originally it was just like a plain background, but then I think when Dallas and Cecilia and I talked, like we kind of thought like, yeah, maybe it should be placed against like a night sky. So that's probably a good thing good change that we did there. Mm -hmm. So this one is October. Ooh, this one's hard for me mm -hmm. to pronounce. So I'm probably going to butcher this one, which is ta Tashna Haja Hagita, which is supposed to be joins both sides of the moon. So I kind of just wanted to illustrate like um, a dry landscape. Um, and then keeping in mind like the geometric shapes and designs, it was supposed to be just like a little village underneath like the night sky with the flashing stars there. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. I appreciate, thank you for your efforts uh, with the language. I think you're, you're probably doing a wonderful job. Uh, and... <laughs> oh, we have no context, but I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, this one's the last one. So this one's November, which is to Hogotawi, which is frost moon. So I just tried to illustrate like a little um, winter scene with like the geometric stars also flashing in the background there. With, um, I was just with uh, something I was noticing or when I first went through your section of the exhibit, um, mm -hmm. I was really feeling uh, that like there was a tr real like narrative sequence between that I mean I was reading it into but I think it's also yeah. quite suggested um, that there's almost like there's this you're kind of in this section which could be you know outdoor it's outdoors today in a in, in Saskatch if you happen to be in Saskatchewan uh, or in a yeah. plains area and there's then you yeah. you're you are 
are kind of taken in through a portal and through this, uh, you enter the spaceship. And then this portion of the work f felt very much like, uh, you know, accessing a console for me um, because mm -hmm. it had these vector graphics that had this, this, uh, this particular consistent form of design. It felt like a futuristic um, console where, you know, if I was, if I, if I understood the language or if I knew what I was supposed to be doing, I would be able to in interact or engage or change somehow or influence uh, things through these graphics here. And I think with the p position of them on the gal, like this, this images of stars, that was really how it was reading for me yeah. um, with the, with the work. Uh, did you, did, am I totally just speculating or was there, is there, uh, I know. <laughs> it's kind of open ended, I guess, like for me, I, um, like all the pieces, um, I guess like from the first one that we looked at, like they're all in a linear order. So like for this one, I had just kind of pictured it as like being on the, the spaceship and um, this is supposed to serve as like a way for them to like revitalize or like learn or keep that language there um, intact. So that's why you just see that night sky there too, because this is like in the process of that journey. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I really quite like it. And we'll, I'll show, we'll continue we to show sail uh, the audience. To a distant yeah. unknown world. This is world. maybe the most so uh, the, the with audience gleaming in our eyes. Right mm -hmm. now, so maybe we should just let, can we uh, all right. learn from this? The stories we will share, the memories in our hearts, creating a new world where time, light, and love would be in. Infinite, circling back as an old melody, time and time again. Great. Okay, I'm just going to turn that down so we'll play in the background. Um, so yeah, this piece, this piece is remarkable, uh, just in the context of the other pieces for having a, um, uh, voiceover happening over top, sort of narrating uh, this uh, this part of the journey or, or this the journey that's represented in uh, this piece, as well as being um, uh, this this piece sort of having even more expansive landscapes that are being traveled through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you tell us about? I'm interested about the voiceover and, and sort of how you came to that. Uh, and yep. then also how you made some of these landscapes. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was um, actually like based off of, I guess, the poem or prose I had uh, written a few years back. <laughs> I can hear it on my end, it's just playing over and over. <laughs> oh, oh, oops. Yeah. Because uh... I was trying to listen to the question at first there, I was like, okay. Oh, I, I'm controlling the audio for the audience, but not for you. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Maybe so we could just, just pause it. That made it yeah. easier for yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Pause. Yeah. There we go. Um, so it's probably like one of the only things that I've actually like ever really written. And it came from, I guess, like my heart in a time like where I was kind of like, hurting and I'd never really written anything before and it was just like a one-time thing for me so then I guess it was I don't know four or five years ago and then this year when I was trying to gather ideas and see um what it was that I wanted to make I actually came across it in a notebook and like reread it and like changed the context of like the original writing um upon like reflection of like the past years um path I was on now and like how it felt like it almost like just fell into my lap for like this piece here. So then I just changed it up and then it was supposed to be like a voiceover. I'm um, kind of like sharing like why we left, um, the importance, um, I don't know, I guess of learning from the past and then changing um, into the future. Uh, it's beautiful too then that it came from your past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, everything's in a big circle, I feel like <laughs> I said. It came, my past came back around now. Fits really well with the motif, the circular motif from the, the last series of works. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so what about the landscapes themselves? Um, uh, this current one yeah, that we're flying over right now. Um, yeah, so for those um, landscapes, I wanted it to be like a flashback of like a green environment that you see that's like happy, healthy, kind of pull that from my memory too. So like kind of goes back to like that first piece that we had look at, looked at. Um, so I wanted it to have that serene kind of feel to it. And then it kind of cuts to like that rough dry land that you see there, which is actually like the same landscape just imagined in a distant far future where like it's no longer um, hospitable. And then it's just this piece is supposed to serve like as like a story for those who are on board, like the ship traveling into like the, this new journey. Uh, yeah, it's. I think just hearing the story of how you did the writing, it uh, really fits well in the narrative um, mm -hmm. of the piece itself. Um, I was a little bit nervous, like actually putting something like that out there because, like, it was very personal to me. But I feel like I'm just trying to push myself out more of my, my comfort zone and trying new things, and then seems like it's received well from a lot of other people that have looked at it so hmm. yeah I'm happy I had a, I had a lot of fun um making like the audio and the um the voice over there adding like changing it up there adding sound effects to it it's a little hard though hearing your voice over and over and over again as you're editing <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's fun to add more effects to it, <laughs> so it sounds... change it up make it sound like it's not really me yeah uh, it's sort it of so similar funny. to what you were saying when you're uh, going over the scene and adding more and more, sort of like tweaking little things in the render before you render it. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. I guess that's a way of working across all these different digital technologies. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually funny too when I was making this piece. My, uh, my sister was in the room with me. I think she was doing some schoolwork there and then she just kind of kept giggling because she could just hear it looping over and over again. It's like she almost kind of like memorized herself. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, sound booths, sound like soundproof booths are a nice luxury, but <laughs> yeah, we don't have them here, just our own living spaces. Um, There's one more piece in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think the next one is. Well, I love them all so much, but this this one is particularly my favorite. Oh, it's my favorite too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, um, yeah, for this piece, I just wanted to, I guess, create what I imagine like a futuristic world might look like, or like how um, the aurora borealis might look, and like I tried to base that off of like I guess some research that I had done. Because I, I always liked reading about um, kind of like science, space exploration. And then I had found out that um, like other planets do have these, and they're um, they're different based on like the atmosphere and the magnetosphere of those planets. So the colors are all different. So I'm just I just tried to pick like super vibrant, rich colors, um, and put them in this space here, which I actually. This was one of like the harder pieces to actually make because those northern lights are actually like their 3D um, pieces that I had made that I just had to extrude. So basically bring up and then like had to fade them out in the sky and like adding those animations to it. <laughs> wow. Like it was all just like a process of trial and error. Like I'm actually surprised that I got them to move and animate within here. And then same thing with like um, I guess like that kind of like space pod that you kind of see I wanted it to um, just be like in the shape of like a teepee kind of imagining you know influencing with our indigenous culture in there the same with like um, the landscape too like you can't really tell for some reason in this video but the landscape's like a kind of purpley yellow color because I tried to just make it look like it's not anything we've seen before um I'm, as a just 
from uh, as a nerd, I'm curious how you got the did the sort of fade out of the uh, the auroras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, I guess like within Blender, I learned how to use like the shading tab in there, which is oh, something okay. I've also never worked in before. <laughs> and it's just, um, oh my God, I'm not using the right word. Transmission, that's the word I'm looking for. And I just basically turned it down to like um, zero. So 100 at the bottom. So it's like full um, solid color and then zero at the top. So it fades out to that. Wow. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the shader yeah. shader is very intimidating. That stuff is very intimidating and blender to me. <laughs> I actually really liked it a lot because like you could just that's how I also got the gradients um, in the northern lights there too and on the landscape. So I found I really, really like that. And I guess that's a big part of environment design that I didn't really know about because like I it's funny enough. Um, that I'm doing all of this stuff because like I get asked this question all the time like what video game like influenced you or like what do you I don't know what draws you in and it's funny because I don't actually play any video games <laughs> I just like like making things that look pretty <laughs> um I, well I was yeah sort of curious just af after you were um uh talking about um having started with illustrator and doing uh being interested in uh vector art and illustration how did you mm -hmm. then move into uh uh doing designing in 3d space and creating in 3d space yeah it was um it was actually yeah the second year of college and we had to um our first one of our first assignments using the 3d was to create like this little isometric room. And then so I actually found that like super challenging at first, just to create this tiny little room. But then once I got the hang of it, oh my God, I just, I fell in love with it. And I created like, uh, again, a little spaceship isometric room with like in there, you could see like the glass um, like window. And I had like the seats and the control panel and some TVs and I had, um, colored lights I use like metallic materials like I just dove in all in the first piece there and then that's when I just all of a sudden just like fell in love with it I had so much fun doing it I remember I probably spent more time on it than I actually like needed to and was supposed to and then presented it in front of the class and that uh, yeah, was it was a pretty good good time and then that's just how it started for me. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting mm -hmm. that from the get go, you're interested in building uh, environments with it. That's sort of, it's as if you were already, I don't know, it almost sounds like there's a part of you that like uh, was, uh, I, I guess, what is that something like, is there ways that you've done environmental design uh, before you found 3D <laughs> software? Uh, I think so. I'm just kind of remembering something from when I was like in high school so that was like oh my god almost late 2000s and I remember there was this like software program I think called like Google SketchUp yeah and I used to just play around in that huh. and like create like little things like in class when I wasn't supposed to and then yeah I guess I also played a lot of Sims growing up too okay. so I also like liked designing my own like I wouldn't actually play the game I'd just be sitting there like making the houses and making them look all pretty and placing all the stuff inside there <laughs> I think that's the exact same artist uh, origin story as us, <laughs> us. <laughs> just the sins <laughs> yeah. I haven't played it in so long it's so funny because I can remember like this one cheat that I had and I think it was like rosebud or something yeah. yes yeah, it indeed was money to, like, buy more stuff for like make my house look nice because yeah. you don't want to like bring the sims through like the various job uh promotions that takes no. long you know caring for them making sure they don't drown in the pool that you put in there yeah it's very yeah. just just give me the cheat the cheat I, yeah i was never interested <laughs> yeah. in playing the game just sort of like building and designing in it yeah that's exactly what i do and i remember too like 
five hours would pass and they'd be like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be asleep now. I yeah. always thought that when I get older, I would just have so much more time to play video games because I would be able to stay up late and not go to school. But I find yeah. I have less time than ever. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, so Dallas, uh, Dallas had a couple more, or, or he just want to share a funny joke that Dallas, when you were talking about using the transmissions shader and going from yeah. 100 at the bottom to uh, zero where it fades up, uh, Dallas yeah. uh, quoted... Uh, the, the some the Kendrick lyric a hundred at the bottom now we hear or sorry it's not Drake Drake, Drake Jeez, sorry. Toronto yeah. come on <laughs> um, and then uh, yeah so oh th then less maybe this is less of a question and uh, but more just uh, some nice feedback from Dallas again such a cool idea and it's <laughs> so radly executed uh, the colors really grab my attention but the movement keeps me there really talented in Blender. And I think it's true that this this is a hard, very difficult thing to pull off, um, like making something that communicates the Aurora Borealis in the way that you've done. And it, it just like, yeah. uh, it really uh, evokes that exactly while also doing this sort of like futuristic uh, interstellar thing that you're also going for. Yeah. Is there a... Uh... Uh whether it's in blender or unity or any of the other software that you mentioned is there anything you're working on now or looking forward to working on in the near future i feel like this whole past month like it's just kind of just finally got to like settle after <laughs> like working in this for like six months straight almost um yeah no i haven't really thought of anything yet but it also took me quite a long time to like develop these ideas in the beginning, I actually had struggled. I had no idea what it is that I wanted to do. And then I think just one day I just forced myself to sit down and like write things out. And then all of a sudden I was just like, all these ideas are pouring in from everywhere. And I was like, I couldn't keep up with myself. So I feel like that's probably going to happen again within like the next couple of weeks. Because I'm going to start actually, yeah, I'm going to set myself down again and make myself come up with some more ideas. <laughs> Amazing. I'm looking forward to that. Um, yes. And I, I'm sure our audiences as well. Um, where can folks find you uh, if they're uh, interested in following along with your creative process? Yeah, um, I guess I pretty much use Instagram the most. So it would just be um, at my handle. So it's just T MacArthur with like two underscores at the end. Great. <laughs> And we'll link that in the chat for everyone who's watching. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for sharing this with us, uh, Taylor. Um, yeah. yeah, it was really, really wonderful uh, and beautiful work. And um, we're, yeah, we're very impressed with what uh, you and Dallas uh, were able to produce and then sort of change to fit changing times for the insight show so thank you so much for sharing it with us yeah thank you it was a little fun actually going back and looking at the process now after it's done well, i had a lot of fun doing this yay yay awesome. <laughs> okay thank you everyone for tuning in and yes we'll share some uh the link to uh taylor's instagram in the chat mm -hmm. but uh that's us that's it for us on thursday night live uh have See you on uh, the next Thursday Night Live episode will be on August 20th, um, uh, where we'll be discussing video games as an art medium with Pippin Barr from Yay. Concordia University. Yay, um, thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.